Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Gene Therapy Basics webinar. Uh, I am Wendy Owens, the Director of Research at HFA. We have the pleasure tonight to have presenter Mark K, Dr. Mark K from Stanford University. Uh, just before we get started, a couple of little housekeeping items. Uh, you will be on mute throughout the broadcast. Uh, but you will be able to ask questions. So in uh, your um, toolbar there with the GoToWebinar, you can type in questions, and we will be holding those questions until the end of the webinar. But we would appreciate it if you would send those along as you have them, or, or write them down and then send them along to us at the end of the webinar. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Kay. Uh, and we are joined tonight by other people from the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. We are doing this webinar series on gene therapy in collaboration with them and appreciate this opportunity. Dr. Kay is the Dennis Fari Family Professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Genetics at Stanford University. He's the head of the Division of Human Gene Therapy and serves as the Associate Chair of Basic Research in Pediatrics. Received a PhD in Developmental Genetics and an MD from Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio, and did his clinical residency in Pediatrics and Medical Genetics at the Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Kay was one of the founding board of directors of the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy and served as the Society's Vice President, President-Elect, and President in 2003 to 2006. He received the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy's Outstanding Investigator Award in 2013. He is a scientific founder of Voyager Therapeutics and Logic Biotherapeutics. The focus of the laboratory that Dr. K runs is to establish the scientific principles required for gene and nucleic acid transfer for the treatment of genetic and acquired diseases. Dr. K held the IND in which AAV was first systematically administered into humans, and this was for hemophilia B. We're very happy to have Dr. K with us tonight. Thank you uh, very much, and uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, today, what I wanted to do is uh, go through uh, some of the basic uh, features of gene therapy, some of the uh, issues that, that arise, and I think that uh, at the end of the lecture, you'll have some general understanding of gene therapy. The second half of the webinar for, for next uh, uh, later on in the month, we'll deal more specifically with gene therapy uh, for hemophilia. So, not able to advance the slide here. Okay, so to get everyone on board, I'd like to go back and uh, if we can go back one slide. Um, and, and use a definition that I actually have used for uh, gene therapy uh, since I started my career in the early 1990s. The definition hasn't changed. So you can think of gene therapy as the introduction of nucleic acids. And in most cases, we talk about DNA or genes. And we're going to restrict our discussion today uh, to somatic cells that are basically any cell of the body that is not a germ cell or, in other words, not a sperm or an egg cell, so that when the gene transfer or the nucleic acid transfer occurs in a patient, there's no transfer of the genetic information to future generations. So the idea is then to use these uh, DNA molecules uh, and deliver them into the body to correct or prevent a pathologic process from occurring. So really what you need to do is think about DNA as a class of pharmaceutical agents like any other class of category of drug. Uh, next slide. So if you look at the flow of genetic information in the cell, and again, when I discuss this, I'm talking about the general uh, idea behind this. There are exceptions to all the rules I'm going to mention today, but for all intent and purposes, the DNA inside of our cells code the, the master uh, building blocks of what the cell will do and what kind of function it will have, whether it's a liver cell, brain cell, heart cell. And the DNA 
is represented by usually two copies for every gene because the DNA itself is divided up into units that are called genes. So one DNA molecule is inherited from mom and the other one from, from your father. So you have two copies of DNA. Now the genetic information is basically encoded by four different letters of the alphabet, A, T, C, and G. These four letters and the order of these four letters dictate what each gene function is. Now, how do you get the genetic information into the building blocks of the cell? So you, as I said, you have two copies of DNA for every gene. You have two copies of, of every gene encoded in the DNA. But you need many, many different copies of the ultimate protein, which makes up the cell membrane or other components of the cell. So to do this, there's an intermediate step where the DNA is actually what we call transcribed into RNA or a messenger RNA that has complementary building blocks to the DNA. And then this messenger RNA is read in, in the cell and it's translated into the protein. And the sequence of the protein is dictated by those letters that I mentioned. Now, as I said, one or two DNA molecules in each cell can make many thousands of copies of RNA. And then each of those RNAs can make thousands of copies of protein. So that's why I've indicated these in, in different intensities of DNA to RNA to protein. So if you have a DNA sequence and you have the letters of the alphabet here for a particular gene, let's say factor nine, as, as um, in a deficient state leads to hemophilia B, if there's a mistake in one of those letters so that the reading or the code is wrong, you won't be able to make a functional copy of the factor nine protein. And as a result, then you'll have hemophilia B. And there are examples of this for many genetic disorders. Some of the hemoglobin disorders, such as sickle, sickle cell, collagen disorders that can actually affect uh, other types of, of diseases that we won't talk about in detail. So if we can go to the next slide. Next, okay. So what do we want to accomplish with gene therapy? We want to add a gene to supply a functionally deficient protein or provide a protein that has a therapeutic effect. So if you're missing a protein such as factor nine, you can add the gene back to the cell so that you can make functional factor nine. The other things you can do in gene therapy that's become of, uh, of great promise is to actually fix a mutation in the gene. That is pluck out that letter in the alphabet that's wrong in a particular gene and insert the right letter. The other thing you can do is you can knock down or knock out a gene. So this may happen because some of the mutations or the mistakes in the alphabet don't lead to a deficiency of the protein, but leads to a protein that has a new function. And that function may be detrimental to healthy condition. So that's called a gain of function mutation. And you can also think of bad genes as viruses that infect our bodies because viruses are extra genes that shouldn't be there. And when the virus replicates and makes its viral gene products, it can cause disease. So we may want to knock down or knock out the viral genes to stop a viral infection, which is another strategy in gene therapy. Next slide. Now, what are the barriers Next slide, please. What are the barrier, or what do we use to deliver these DNA molecules? We use what's called viruses, and viruses are used because these viruses have evolved over millions of years to become efficient vehicles to basically insert their genetic information into our cells. But when they do that, they make us sick. So what we do as gene therapists is we, we basically, we trick the virus into taking up, instead of its own genetic information, the genetic information that we want to add to a cell, such as the factor IX gene in a patient with hemophilia B. So we do this in a way that once the DNA gets into the cell, 
it can no longer replicate itself. So we're basically using what has evolved over millions of years, the viral core or the, out, the outside of the virus, to actually be able to insert its DNA into our cells because it's so good at doing that. Next slide. What are the barriers to actually what's happened uh, that's made gene therapy so difficult? Because in concept, the ability to genetically engineer a virus to deliver the DNA is not as, seems relatively simple. But you have to understand that the cell has developed lots of ways to try to keep out exogenous DNA sequences, or else our cells would be uh, flooded with information, genetic information it doesn't want or need. So even if you can get the vector that has your therapeutic DNA into the cell, uh, or at the cell surface, it has to enter the cell. And ultimately, it has to get into the compartment where our cell's DNA is stored and be can be functional. And that's actually a very long road to happen because along the way, we have things that are called endosomes that take up big molecules that get into our cell and basically degrade them. And viruses have evolved good ways to actually trick the endosomes into still allowing the DNA to enter the nucleus where our chromosomal DNA is that, um, that I mentioned earlier. Now, once the DNA gets into the nucleus, you can have two things happen. One is that the DNA can covalently or chemically attach to our chromosomal DNA, that is our natural DNA, or it can exist in somewhat of a free state where it's not chemically attached in the, in, the, um, in the same type of way. Now, why is this important? Well, number one is if the cell is going to divide many times and make daughter cells, if it's not covalently attached, you're gonna lose the DNA. And it depends on how long you need the vector DNA to be there to treat the disease. If you're trying to treat an infection, having the DNA from the vector there for a short period of time until the infection is over, that, that may be fine. But if you're trying to treat a genetic disease, you want the DNA to persist there for the life of the individual. And therefore, you need to either put the DNA into a cell that doesn't divide a quiescent cell, or if it is a cell that divides, you need to actually get it to covalently attach so that when the cell divides, it takes along the vector DNA. So assuming that the DNA there from the vector is made, it gets translated into the messenger RNA that makes the protein. And the protein now is a, presumably a protein that might be new to the body. If you're born without a normal factor IX gene, for example, you don't make factor IX protein, if you start to make factor IX, there's a possibility that you could actually get an immune response against the factor IX because it's not, it's recognized as foreign because individuals who don't make factor IX from birth don't know that that's supposed to be a natural product in the body. So that's something, these are all things that we had to contend with over the last several decades to get gene therapy to the point now where it's starting to show some success. Next slide, please. So very quickly, I'll just say that the very earliest form of gene therapy was really organ transplantation. People did bone marrow transplants to treat individuals who had certain genetic defects because you could put cells from another individual who had a normal copy of the gene that was deficient in the patient. And then those cells could then take over and make the appropriate blood cells and progenitors and white blood cells that then in, in some diseases could actually correct the genetic deficiency. The same thing would occur in some liver transplants. Certain patients are born with very severe inborn errors of metabolism and the enzyme is made in the liver so if you did a liver transplant from a donor who has the normal copy of the gene for the enzyme, you basically are putting a, a gene therapy into the patient by doing an organ transplant. The difficulty with this, obviously, is that there aren't enough organs, and you have to worry about immune rejection of the organ, 
And these individuals then have to stay on immunosuppressive therapy for life, which can have other complications. So by doing it with the gene insertion technology that I'm going to talk about in the next slide, you overcome the issue of having to do organ transplantation. Next slide. If you look, for example, at the factor IX situation or hemophilia, the point I want to make is when you realize that in order for blood to clot when it's supposed to, there's a whole number of proteins that are needed, a whole number of normal gene products that are needed to get the blood to clot normally. So when we find a patient with hemophilia and we want to talk about inserting the gene, we have to be sure that we are inserting the gene, which is deficient in that patient. And it, again, if we pick the wrong gene, like, like for hemophilia B, we, we want to pick factor nine, not factor eight and vice versa. That's what's important. And it may seem obvious for diseases like factor eight or factor nine, but there may be other diseases for which the pathways are less well understood and become more complicated. So it's very important that we know what the gene defect is in order to do gene therapy. Next slide. Now, one of the diseases that's gained a lot of attention is severe combined immunodeficiency, also known as bubble boy disease. These individuals are born without a functioning immune system, and if they don't live in a protected bubble their whole life, they ultimately will succumb to infections that people who have an intact immune system will never get. And the reason this disease was studied from a gene therapy point of view for so long is because there's actually more people that studied it than actually had it. And the reason is gonna become apparent in the next slide. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So in bubble boy uh, immunodeficiency disorder, what occurs here is that there's a, a gene and it, there's several different genes that can be deficient that can lead to the same type of clinical outcome. And as I mentioned earlier, that's why it's really important to identify which gene it is because we wanna make sure we're inserting the correct gene. But we wanna put in the blood progenitor cells a normal copy of the gene that's missing because it was known based on the biology of what actually caused the immune deficiency that if you could implant cells that were genetically modified in even a very, very small number of these progenitor stem cells, a few progenitors that are genetically modified could repopulate the whole immune system. And in the early days, the vectors that we used to do gene therapy were actually very inefficient at inserting genes. So the idea was that this would be a really good disease to try to treat because at the time, we could only introduce the gene into a very small number of these stem cells, but we knew that that would be enough to potentially cure a patient from this disease. Next slide, please. And this is what's called a selective advantage. So what you do in patients who have this type of bubble boy disease is you basically can diagnose them, let's say at birth or even shortly after birth. You can isolate their own stem cells from the blood and then in the laboratory, you can introduce a vector that puts the gene into those stem cells and then re-implant those cells back into the individual. So this is very similar to what's done in bone marrow transplants. And the reason it's different than uh, like an organ transplant is you're using the individual's own cells. So the risks of rejection or severe graft versus host type problems really doesn't occur. So this is a much preferred route over using somebody else's bone marrow that has a normal copy of the gene. And this has now been used successfully to treat individuals with um, the SCID or severe combined immunodeficiency. Next slide. Now, one of the negatives about this is that when you use viruses or vectors that insert their DNA into, into the chromosome of the individual, there is a, a slight chance, and this has happened, there's a lot of ways to reduce this risk, 
but there's a slight chance that the gene will actually covalently attach itself next to a gene that if it's altered in its expression can cause cancer. And this is something that has occurred in some of these uh, rare disorders that have been treated. But as we've discovered this, there are ways to try to circumvent this, and this has become much less of a risk. Next slide. Now, the other type of thing that I mentioned, so, so far I've talked about adding a gene, but what about reducing a gene? Why would you wanna do that? Well, it's known from genetics that there are patients who are deficient in a protein called CCR5. And it turns out that 1% of humans don't have a functional copy of this gene. They have a mutation in both copies, the one inherited from mom and dad, and they don't make this protein and they're totally normal. But what's interesting is these individuals are resistant to HIV infection. And this was found out because there were a number of high-risk patients who never developed HIV infection or AIDS. And this has turned out to be the genetic reason why that is. So in a patient who ended up having a complication of HIV or AIDS, needed a bone marrow transplant and received bone marrow from an individual who didn't have a normal copy of CCR5. And that patient now is HIV free. So what one can do then is you can express something, and I'll mention this in a minute, or find a way to functionally remove CCR5 in individuals who are infected with HIV because the, this protein is needed for the virus to continue infecting cells. Next slide. So this is, this is really a good example of where you might want to silence a gene. And the question comes in, how do you do that? Well, there's a whole area now of, of, of an area called genome editing. And genome editing and gene therapy are used together. And they're used together because you can use the vector to deliver a gene or some sort of sequence that can now pinpoint the exact location in the genome, the exact gene sequence. There's three billion of these letters, actually six billion, one from copy from mom, one from dad. But you can design enzymes that are encoded in a gene that will know to recognize an exact spot in the genome. And it will cut that gene. And then the DNA will be repaired by natural mechanisms. And most of the time, it will be repaired erroneously, and you will induce a mutation, and you're able to knock out that gene function. And these are the kinds of trials that are being now tested for diseases like HIV infection. Next slide. The other, there's another way to do this, and this is also a popular area of research now. It's called RNA interference. And what we've learned over the years is that there are non-coding RNAs that actually their role is to turn down genes. That is, it, 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 the gene product is made, the messenger RNA, as I pointed out earlier, is made, and then it goes to be made into translated into protein. But there are non-coding RNAs that have sequence matches with the messenger RNA and what happens is if the messenger RNA and this non-coding or the short RNA bind to each other, it actually results in the destruction of the messenger RNA. So there's a way to turn off genes after the messenger RNA is made. And this process is called RNA interference. It's based on a natural mechanism that our body uses to regulate genes. And what's so remarkable is that you can actually turn down the gene by sometimes almost 100%. And this is a whole nother area of therapeutics that are being explored in combination with gene therapy to turn off genes. Next slide. Now, one thing I just wanna leave you, two, two things I wanna leave you with in generalities. We've talked about genes that encode proteins that make up the structures of our cells that makes the structure of our hair, our skin, what have you, clotting factors, et cetera, et cetera. But it turns out the DNA sequence in our body 
only a small percentage, a few percent of those DNA sequences encode for proteins. The rest of the sequences for many years, a number of years ago, people called it junk DNA because they thought it was just there and didn't have function. But that never made sense because why would it be there if it wasn't functional? Well, in recent years, we've learned that this DNA, even though it doesn't make a protein or doesn't encode for a protein, is still transcribed into RNA molecules of all sorts of different sizes and shapes, if you will. And it turns out many of these RNAs are regulatory RNAs, and they regulate the expression of the protein encoding gene by very diverse mechanisms that we're really just starting to learn and understand. And by manipulating these RNAs, they can be used in different approaches to mitigate certain disease phenotypes. And as we learn more about what this dark matter of the genome does, we can develop strategies using our gene transfer vectors and our genome editing strategies to actually manipulate uh, gene expression in various ways to treat genes that may be more, uh, uh, treat uh, medical disorders that are more complex than what we call simple genetic Mendelian, uh, Mendelian genetic uh, disorder. So there's a huge amount of potential for this. And we really are just starting to uncover uh, this area in more detail. And it's something, if you're interested in, I would pay attention to. And then finally, in the last slide, I want to say that, or the last two slides, I want to say that ultimately, everyone at birth, instead of getting the blood spots and we you know, screen for a dozen or so, half a dozen uh, diseases, We'll have their people will have infants will have their genome sequence. We'll be able to determine their susceptibility to certain diseases, even if it's not apparent at birth. And we'll be able to give them healthy choices if somebody has is predis, predisposed to early um, heart disease. They may be on special diet, but we also may be able to give a gene therapy as a preventative just like we give vaccines now to prevent the onset of infectious disease. And as a pediatrician, I always say prevention is better. We want to treat the disease before it actually happens in the sense before we actually have symptoms. And in the final slide next, I'll say that we've talked about gene therapy to treat diseases that are um, really life-threatening or, or, or have a, a, marked effect on, a marked effect on the quality of life. But as we learn more about genetics and how this influences behavior, there are going to be other disorders where maybe it's not going to be so clear that we should use gene therapy to treat. If you think about neuropsychiatric diseases, there are clearly uh, uh, genetic, uh, there are genes that have yet to be discovered that can be inherited that give you very high risk for developing, let's say, bipolar illness. I don't think anyone would have trouble using a gene therapy if we could to treat that uh, type of disorder. But what about other things like addictions, antisocial behavior, boosting intelligence, athletics, et cetera, et cetera? And those are things that society over time will have to make decisions about. But for now, what I think we're seeing a, a, a great deal of early success is in treating some of the diseases for which there's no other medical therapy. And I think that you're going to see that gene therapy over the next decade, we're going to see more and more successes. It's not going to be immediate. Though, and you know we probably will have some setbacks, but we hope that these setbacks will be uh, minimal because it does take time to translate what we learn in the laboratory into, into uh, trying it in people. It does take time. So I'm gonna end there and uh, I guess we'll open it up for the question uh, time. Thank you very much, Dr. K. We appreciate it. And if the audience does have questions, please type those into the question box in your dashboard control panel for the GoToWebinar. Happy to, to read those off. Uh, we do have a first question. 
Um, he said, hello, what is the difference between DNA and RNA? Well, um, so there's a functional difference and I, you know, I'm, uh, it's unclear to me whether you want to know the chemical difference or the functional difference. So let me answer both. Uh, DNA and RNA are very similar chemically. DNA is doxy, uh, um, the, the D stands for deoxy. And basically it's the lack of an oxygen uh, or hydroxyl group on a sugar base. So chemically, DNA and RNA are very similar. There's some other subtle differences in one of the bases, but it's not really critically important. But functionally, DNA is in the nucleus and it's double-stranded. So those letters actually, there's complementary pairs of the letters. And the order of those letters, as I mentioned, is what's the code that basically is read into a protein. But the RNA is what is needed to actually get the, the code of, from the DNA and get it made into a protein. So the messenger RNAs are made as like complementary copies to the DNA in a process called transcription. And the RNAs for most, uh, for all intent and purposes are not double-stranded, they're single-stranded. So they basically carry the genetic information from the DNA into the part of the cell that can then convert the RNA into a protein. So the, the letters of the alphabet are read as they come from the DNA through the messenger RNA and they get turned into the protein based on those code, uh, alphabet code uh, of those four letters. The order of those letters are what's critical. So Think of the DNA as like the encyclopedia that has all the information uh, that's going to tell the cell what it needs to do. And the RNA is going to transmit that information into actually making the gene products that make our cells, make the, the blood, make the proteins in the blood, um, et cetera. Great, thank you very much. We have another question. Uh, the question is, what is an example of changing DNA code that would stop a protein production? Um, I'm sorry, what, what's an example or what's the outcome? What is, I, I'm sorry. What is an example? I, I'm, I'm guessing probably an example of, of a protein you would want to stop production of that's causing a problem, such as a disease. Right. So, so I mentioned the CCR5. It doesn't cause a problem unless you're infected with HIV. But I think this is a good question because there are examples where people are born uh, with mutations that actually cause a protein to be turned on um, inappropriately. Or because of the mutation, the protein now uh, functions in a, in a different way. So some of the genes and the proteins that cause cancer or mutations that develop in a cell that cause cancers are the result of a mutation in a protein that now gives the protein um, a function that now causes your cells to grow uncontrolled. So you would want to uh, fix that mutation, if you will, because you'd want then, if you could fix that mutation, then that would help inhibit the cancer from growing because now the signaling from that protein would be stopped. The other, another example would be like sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia, that disease is complicated by the fact that you make an abnormal form of hemoglobin. Now, the sickle hemoglobin results from the change in the code and the sickle hemoglobin, the, the shape of the sickle hemoglobin actually has part of, is part of the detrimental effect of that disorder. So again, fixing that mutation would turn this pathologic protein, if you will, into a normal functioning uh, hemoglobin uh, molecule that then could carry uh, uh, oxygen in, in the red blood cells. There are other genetic disorders such as some of the um, uh, there's there's a disorder called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which again, there's one form of this disease 
where the protein mutation, this is the most common form, actually leads to the inability of the protein to be secreted into the blood because the protein's function is to combat certain enzymes in the blood, keep them in check or balance. But the mutation actually messes up the ability of the protein to fold in the right conformation. And as a result, the protein just builds up in the liver cells where it's made, and it can't be secreted into the blood. But as it builds up in the liver cells, it kills the liver cells. And it can be so destructive that somebody might need a liver transplant. So those are just Wait. some examples. Um, I mentioned two viruses. Viruses are basically they're extra genes that get into our cells that ultimately make us sick by different mechanisms. But these are would be extra genes that we want to get rid of those functions. So there are many groups trying to develop the, the RNAi expressed from a vector that would actually turn off the messenger RNA that's being made by a virus so that it's no longer able to replicate and cause illness. Great, we have a bunch of questions coming in. Okay. So uh, I'll sure. move to the next one. Are there still concerns about an immune response if the body is making a new protein from its own cells? There, um, that's a good question. The answer is yes. There's always going to be that concern. Um, the there are lots of ways to attempt to mitigate that from happening and uh i don't have time to get into all the details of that but but i think this is a concern that isn't going to go away fortunately there's not been an example where there's been a, an immune response against the protein that leads to uh, increased severity of the disease now let, let me give an example I'm sure most on the phone probably know something about inhibitors uh, for either factor eight or factor nine. And patients who get protein infusions, there's a certain proportion who develop inhibitors or basically antibodies against the protein because it's recognized as foreign. Um, and then that can become a medical problem to, because you need to control bleeding, but you can't really supply an efficient amount uh, effective amount of the protein because the antibodies are actually eliminating the protein. Now, if that occurred in a, a gene therapy trial, that would be a problem. And fortunately, in the hemophilia trials, that has not been observed as of yet. Now, there's some people who feel that using gene therapy will reduce the risk of developing inhibitors because one of the ways you treat inhibitors is by giving high dose steady state levels of the protein. And I think that this is something though that we are gonna to have to always watch for, for quite a long time. It may happen, but we hope that if it happens, it's temporary and or it doesn't happen very often. And so far we've been fortunate that it hasn't happened, but the question about do we worry about it, we always, yet yeah, we do. Great, thank you very much. Uh, another question, will gene therapy be permanent? That's a good question too. So the question is, will gene therapy be permanent? And it's a very complex issue because it depends on what type of gene therapy you're doing. If you get the DNA from the vector to chemically attach to our own DNA, and it's in, a, it's in a stem cell or a cell that is going to give rise to daughter cells, that's what we call them, daughter cells, that will persist in the body indefinitely, it could last indefinitely with a single administration. Some of the vectors, though, the DNA doesn't chemically attach to our DNA. And if those cells divide, it may not last. Now, what we don't know is if we're treating like the neurons in the brain, it was originally thought neurons don't divide or they, and, and if we could get the DNA there, it would last forever. But now it's not clear if that's true or not. Interesting, the vector that's been used in hemophilia in the liver, which I'll talk more about next time in, in great detail, that doesn't chemically attach at very high rates. 
And it's interesting because the expression has persisted now in some patients out over five years. And we don't really understand exactly why that's happening. We think that perhaps the liver cells aren't turning over as rapidly as we originally thought they would naturally. But I think that experimentally in animals, if we do induce the liver cells to divide, we, it won't last forever. We know that if we treat infants with that type of vector in the liver, that as the liver grows, we probably will lose it. But there are ways to try to use the genome engineering with the vectors to actually get the DNA to chemically insert itself at the exact location that we want it to, so that we know that it's a safe place, so that the likelihood that it's going to chemically attach itself next to a gene that will ultimately cause cancer becomes extremely low. So it's a long answer because it's not always clear. There are some strategies where we believe it, it there, and, and there's good evidence that a single uh, um, dosing, whether it's you know through like this uh, bone bone marrow injection after uh, after um, gene modification, versus um, some you know there there's good evidence it could last indefinitely, but what's unclear is in some of the other disorders when we use vectors that don't covalently attach to our DNA if it's going to last lifelong or not. And then the question is, can you re-administer? And one of the issues with using the viruses or the viral vectors, it's like when you get infected with a virus, you become immune to it. So you're un usually unable to get the same virus infected a second time. That's why, you know, flu shots every year, those, those mutate rapidly, but you don't get the same uh, 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 exact strain of flu infection. So people are working on strategies so that when they give the vector initially, you won't develop an immune response against the vector so that if you have to give it again, or we could do what nature does and perhaps use different strains of the, of the virus to make the vector so that if you needed a second shot 10 years later, you could give that vector uh, a different strain of, of a modified vector a second time, and and you, and and it would evade the immune response because the variant is uh, different enough that it wouldn't be recognized by the immune response you developed to the first vector. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, and the next question is: What is the most significant obstacle to transferring laboratory observations into clinical? Yeah, I mean, that's a, you know, these are all really good questions. Um, well, it turns out that what we've learned is that, that, that we can't always predict what's going to happen from animal models. We've learned a lot of things that were totally unexpected. So for, I'll give you a couple examples. Some of the vectors that are given by intravenous infusion that are, that are, um, that are taken up primarily by the liver. When you inject those viruses in animals and, and you, th there's all these different variants of, of the vectors that can be made. And you pick the one that works really well in an animal. And then what we've learned is that when you go into humans, the relative ability of the vector to get into the liver in a human doesn't necessarily correlate with the animal data. So what we and others have done is that we've engineered animals like mice so that they can um, take up human liver cells and their liver actually becomes a chimeric between a human liver and a mouse liver. And we can actually study in that situation which vectors are better taken up by the human liver cells and then take that into the clinic and hopefully there'll be a better correlation. There's some indications that, that, that this model may be a relatively good predictor, but there's no, not nearly enough data yet because not enough humans have been treated that we can really you know, say with any type of certainty that this will be an improved model. But what I'm probably gonna, what probably is gonna end up happening is, is just like any model, it, it has some predictive ability it may not be the ultimate, and you have to take a plethora 
of different uh, studies to try to predict which one's going to be the best in humans. The second thing is that the immune response to either the vector or the product that the vector's making is, can't be predicted well at all from animal studies. And there have been certain types of immune responses, and, and these haven't stopped the trials, and there are ways to treat this with a pretty benign uh, temporary drug treatment. I'll maybe talk more about that next time. But this type of response, we actually found this when we treated humans, and we had done all sorts of animal studies, all different kinds of animals. And this, this type of response was never found in animals. In fact, people now have spent lots of research time and money trying to recapitulate this response in animals so we can study it more and, and, and make improvements before going into humans. But nobody's been successful at this. So, the, and then the third uh, component is the animal studies can be done relatively relatively rapidly. But because these types of studies are like first in human, and there isn't a long history of using these types of drugs, changing the clinical trial, even changing it a little bit, takes a lot of regulatory um, discussions, um, a lot of uh, changes to the protocol in terms of, let's say, manufacturing a variant of the vector can cost lots of money and take lots of time. So there is a time lag barrier issue here too. And it's really important though, because we wanna protect people, we don't wanna do things haphazardly and cause more harm than good. But these are the types of barriers when we go from animals into humans that we deal with at this time. So just to summarize, the issue is understanding how to translate which vector that works in animals is going to work in humans, understanding the immune response issues to the vector or even the protein that's ultimately made by the vector once it gets into the cells, and just the time lag from being able to do animal study and then uh, getting this approved uh, and ready to go into humans. Thank you very much for that, that response. Uh, Mark, I think we have time for uh, one more question here. Uh, and the question is, is there a lot of investment interest in this research? I recently saw that a company had a hard time marketing a gene therapy, and I'm concerned that that, there might, that might have a chilling effect on the pipeline for these products. Uh, you're probably talking maybe about, uh, I, I'm guessing, the GSK decision. Um, you know, that, that's a really, comp you know, again, even though this is not as uh, a scientific answer, it's still a very complex uh, situation. Gene therapy back in the, like, 1990s, early 1990s, there was probably over-enthusiasm for, for gene therapy. People in the field were making promises like, okay, we can probably cure this disease or that disease within the next five years using gene therapy. The concept was simple, but actually in those days, there were still barriers that it wasn't so clear that there was an obvious solution to. So I think that, you know, people got carried away a bit and, and that's unfortunate. And in fact, there were some bad outcomes in gene therapy trials where a, a patient uh, died uh, in a gene therapy trial. So gene therapy got a lot of negative press. There was, uh, became less interest in investing in gene therapy, et cetera, et cetera. Then over time, as things started to progress and there started to be some you know, uh, success stories, um, pharma and uh, biotech had a resurgence in the area and there became more investment dollars. And, and there are, there continues to be an infusion of investment dollars. But it was interesting too that in the 1990s, when you talk to people about developing a gene therapy treatment for a rare disease, the pharmaceutical companies really weren't that interested. And really the NIH was funding 
uh, the government was funding most of these types of, of uh, early uh, uh, preclinical studies or even some of the early clinical studies because big pharma would say, you know, there's no money to be made. You know, it costs a lot of money to bring a drug to market and the market size is small. And, you know, they have to survive financially because if they don't make money, uh, they won't exist. So, you know, there's there's logic to their argument. But over time, uh, there's been a resurgence in, in trying to develop therapies for rare diseases because I think there is a, a profit. But I think even more importantly, uh, there's proof of concept studies that can be done. And once you show that a vector works for one disease, even if it's rare, you can theoretically use it for other diseases. And as we learn more about what genes influence more common diseases, we can use the vector for that. So there is an interest. Um, there are going to be decisions made based on a whole host of complicated issues about whether uh, to continue with a program or not. Um, but I would say there's not one size fits all. I think even that company is going to continue R&D into other uh, gene therapies for other types of disorders. I mean, I don't want to speak for them at all, um, but I think in general right now, there is a reasonable uh, 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 investment stream. Of course, we would always like more, um, but I, I do think that uh, you, were, you are going to see more and more um, commercial dollars uh, being invested in, in gene therapy because I think it's become very obvious that there are going to be more successes not only for rare diseases, but even for diseases that would be more common. Thank you very much, Dr. K. Uh, and thank you for everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, we will, uh, we do have a few other additional questions, but really don't have the time to answer them at this point in time in order to keep to our schedule. Um, we will respond to those questions uh, um, after the webinar and appreciate them very much. If you have additional questions, uh, and have not posted them yet to, to our question board here, please do email us at research at hemophiliafed.org and we'll be happy to respond. So again, thank you so much for participating. We'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Unicure and Spark, for their funding of these, this uh, webinar series. And thank you again to Dr. K for his uh, uh, leading us through the basics of gene therapy. Everyone have a nice night.